from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Their new book is about how a beam from the World Trade Center was turned into the bow of a naval ship. But it's really about more than that, as you'll hear today. It's a very sensitive book that in the end is quite inspiring. Janet Nolan lives outside Chicago. She's the author of five books, including PB&J Hooray, which is about building something slightly smaller than a ship, a uh, peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Thomas Gonzalez uh, was born in Havana, Cuba, and now lives outside of Atlanta. He worked for more than 20 years as a design principal and creative development manager at Coca-Cola and has directed campaigns for such clients as Delta Airlines, NASCAR, and McDonald's. Uh, he has illustrated a number of books, the first of which uh, sort of presaged this book. It was called 14 Cows for America, and it's about Wilson Kameli Naoma, a Maasai from Kenya who had gone to the United States to study and was in New York City on 9-11. And he was moved to uh, show his feelings for his adoptive country. And he, he did it by donating cows blessed by his village elders to the American ambassador to Kenya. Janet Nolan has written that it isn't hard for her to find interesting topics to write about. The hard part, she says, is determining if the topic will make an interesting book. Facts are great, but what matters is the heart of the story within those facts. Our next speakers are very good at finding that heart and illustrating those stories. So please join me in welcoming Janet Nolan and Thomas Gonzalez. So I'm Janet Nolan. Um, I Okay, and this is our book, Seven and a Half Tons of Steel. And um, I'm so happy to be here today to talk to you about my new book. I'm the author, and Thomas Gonzalez is the illustrator, and we're both going to be discussing how this book came into being. Uh, so, yes, yeah, Seven and a Half Tons of Steel is a nonfiction picture book about building a Navy ship, the USS New York, whose bow contains seven and a half tons of steel that came from a beam in the World Trade Center towers. And this is the actual ship. So what happened is that after the events of September 11th, 2001, a decision was made to give metal from the World Trade Center towers to the Navy. The metal was taken to um, a foundry in Louisiana where it was melted down at a really, really high heat, so hot that it turned into liquid metal, and it was poured into a mold into the shape of a Navy ship's bow, and it was so hot it took four days to cool. And then the bow what was a beam, but now a bow was then taken to a shipyard in near New Orleans. And while the ship was being built, Hurricane Katrina hit the city, and um, it was a devastating storm, and many of the shipbuilders lost their homes and were homeless, and temporary housing was built called Camp Katrina, uh, K and K, which gave uh, the shipbuilders a place to live and food to eat so that work could continue on the ship. The ship's motto is strength forged through sacrifice, never forget. And I think it's personally really powerful that they put the metal in the bow of the ship because it's, um, the bow is what cuts the water and it's what leads the way. So. I wanted to talk for a moment about why I love writing nonfiction. Um, one of the reasons is I love learning new things. Whenever I want to learn something new, my first stop is always the children's section of my local public library. Uh, the tables are a little short and the chairs are a little small for me, but since I write for children, I think it's really important to learn at a child's perspective. I think it informs my writing if I start with picture books. Um, I can also obviously go up to adult levels, interview adults, read adult literature, read adult magazines, uh, any kind of uh, resource. But um, I think that that's the place for me to start. And I also think personally that um, anything you'd ever want to know is in a picture book. Uh, I also enjoy writing nonfiction because I do love going beyond um, the facts to find what I do call the heart of the story. We all live in the digital age where um, 
with amazing access to information. We can Google anything at any time and know something about something we may have known nothing about just moments before. But, but what does all that information mean? And does knowing a fact equate with understanding? So I knew a fact, I knew a beam had been used in building a Navy ship's bow. But what did that mean? What did that mean for the men and women who built the ship? What did that mean for the men and women who serve on the ship? And what does that mean for us as a nation? Those were some of the questions I was asking myself as I began researching and writing this book. And it was through my research that I began to find the answers. And the answers, as they often are, were found in stories. I heard stories of people who delayed retirement so that they could um, continue working so that they could help build the ship. I heard stories about people who requested transfers within the military so that they could serve on the ship. And again and again and again, I heard stories about people who serve in honor of, in honor of someone that they knew, in honor of New York, in honor of our nation. The first page of the book reads, there is a ship a Navy ship. It is called the USS New York. It is big like other Navy ships, and it sails like other Navy ships, but there is something different, something special about the USS New York. I believe that is true um, because the ship is part of our history, and it embodies our stories. And it, I consider it, it was my honor and privilege to write this picture book. Um, so what is a picture book? It's a story told in two ways, in words and in images. So when you read um, a middle grade or young adult or even an adult novel, the um, author has described everything with words. Language is what they use for the setting, the characters, and the character's emotional state. But um, picture book authors, we have a different job. We have to tell a complete story while still leaving room for illustrations. But the interesting thing is, that we have no, at least usually I don't, I have no idea who the illustrator will be, so I have no idea what the pictures will actually look like. So um, it isn't until after I've finished a manuscript, sent it off to an editor, an editor has decided to take on that project, that the illustrator is chosen. So it's a little, the writing for a picture book author without the illustrator is a little like learning a dance without a dance partner. but. When it all comes together, the words and the images, the author and the illustrator, that's when the magic happens. And I think uh, picture books are truly magical, and I certainly think the work of Thomas Gonzalez was uh, beyond magical. It was inspirational. All right, so you're up. So I'm Tom Gonzalez, and I was fortunate enough to uh, do this book with Janet. And um, I have done this before. I did the 14 Cows for America, so I you knew a little bit about the whole, the whole world of 9-11. Um, it's a very difficult book to do visually because usually the illustrator relies more on visual. So you do the research and you see things that you just don't want to see again. Um, so, but I'm going to go walk through really quickly kind of how the process works. Um, I get the manuscript and I read it and I put it away. And I actually try to do a picture book without words. I try to make sure I can communicate. If you cannot really read the word, you can kind of put it together by what you're looking at, which is difficult to do because you really can't really do that without the words to begin with. So, uh, my name. And basically, um, I, I have some thoughts about it. Um, this really kind of goes through what was the mindset of people at the, uh, in the morning before 9-11. You know, there was the World Series. There's it's a totally different world, and, and I find that interesting every time I do something about 9-11 that the, the, the 10th of September was so different. It, it was just so different in so many ways, and a lot of kids don't realize how it was before. Um, I basically start with a gut feeling. Um, I'll do sketches and really quick to capture the space, make sure that the, that the person looking at this doesn't get tired of the same image and so forth. And I brought, this is the actual, this is how I start a book. I spent about a couple of weeks on this, or a week maybe, and I just kind of lay it out. I swap it around. It's like making a movie. Um, but this is exactly the one I use for this book. Now from here, I'll start developing what I like. I make notes, thoughts. 
I'll even listen to certain music to kind of conjure up some ideas and things that were happening at the time. Uh, it just makes some, it's a you know, frame of reference. Um, so an example would be, there's the, there's the uh, sketch over there. There's an inter intermediate sketch that I do. It's, it gets very tight, and it, it really helps me kind of spread the page out a little bit so that one eye doesn't really land somewhere. It's just aware of the flow. It's just, just a gut feeling. And then that's a, that's a really tight sketch. I usually do in, um, in pencil, and then I'll color it. I'll, I'll start playing with the color. And that's the final. Now, the final had a rainbow. And when we, before press, we decided to take it out. There's, a, there's some things that come through discussions that are infinite amount of discussions about little details. But we do think about a lot of things very carefully. So if you look at the book, you're not going to see the rainbow, but you will see you know, this image right here. And these are just other examples of some of the illustrations in the book. Um, I wanted to play off the fire of 9-11 and the coolness of the ocean and the ship. And there are some more images, too. Um, one thing to note here, originally when the book was, uh, was, the way I wanted to do the book was actually a lot of pages where there was no text. And it was really scenes in New York before the plane struck. So for example, um, there's a picture of New York City with the cabs. And you can see the reflection in a mirror of this plane. That is not supposed to be there. It, the whole idea was that these planes were not supposed to be where they were at, but nobody noticed them. Um, so some of the pages, you see the plane somewhere in the plane, in a corner somewhere. And everybody's oblivious to that. And this is the ship right there. And I think that was it. <laughs> Any questions? Oh, she asked if anyone visited the ship. I actually had the opportunity to do that years ago before the, I knew about this book. I did not. Um, so I did a lot of research. I watched a lot of film over and over again. You find stuff that you never knew you knew, didn't know. But no, we didn't. We, I, I made the best effort to learn. I, I had a model of it, the whole bit, just to, you know. And, and the reason it's important is because there's, there's a, two or three ships that look very similar, but they're very different. So I didn't want some expert to say, you got the wrong ship. Because it was just so confusing when I was doing that. Um, can, I, can I answer Oh, sure. Too? Go ahead. Um, I haven't seen the ship either, but um, I know that the book has just gotten to the man who, who's going to become captain of the ship shortly, and um, he sent a personal note, which was really touching to me, that just how much this book meant to him and to the people who serve on the boat, and he actually said thank you for writing this story. So that was really powerful to receive that from the captain of the ship. I happened to read this book with my daughter, and uh, um, I found that uh, your your style, your painting style, is like oil painting, and also um, the picture is like moving like. So, um, I'm wondering when you design the book, um, do you have uh, such kind of idea before you design that it should be um, a moving like or oil painting like? And so this is my question. Oh, I I, I usually. I don't do oil paintings because they take too long to dry, and I decided it's best to just do pastels. Usually the way I work, I, I'll sketch it out, I'll get tighter, and I'll either get pictures reference, or I'll even shoot my own reference, or even an object, and I'll start putting it together. Then I work very hard about the light. I do a pastel, I do airbrush, I do ink on top of it. I mean, it's just a, lot, a bunch of stuff. And basically, I find myself retouching the illustration to make it look realistic. I want, I want the reader to be there, in a way. So. I hope that answers your question. Janet, the, the tone of the book is uh, perfect, in my opinion, as far as how you present this really awful event in a way that, uh, and, and with, matched with the illustrations. At the, the beginning, there's some very jarring, not, not uh, gratuitous illustrations, but you show the plane, you show a building. Um, how did you arrive on the right tone or voice and what was going through your mind as you 
as you develop that tone? Um, I, I think for the tone of the book, what I did is I never told myself in my mind that I was writing a 9-11 book. I always thought I was writing a book about a piece of metal. And I stayed really close to that piece of metal that left New York and went to the foundry and then to the shipyard and became the bow of a ship. The, silent, the book has a silent beginning, three pages, and I think that that's really brilliant because it puts you, there are no words for 9-11, there are no words to describe really what happened, but those three pages put you in the pro proper mindset to approach the book. And then my language stays very, very close to the metal. So the echo is there and the sentiment is there, but I didn't have to use the language to describe 9-11 and I was able to describe something I think more transformative, which was about building a ship. Thank you so much. This was great. Thank you. Thanks. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.